so good to see all our dear friends here tonight. Before we begin our talk, I just want to survey the audience real quick. How many know what the law of action, what the definition is? You can just buy a show of hands. I, I want to actually... Okay. You can just raise your hand if you know it. If you think you know it. I want to ask you what it is. And how many think they know or how many know what the law of cause and effect is? You could just raise your hand. I won't call on you, embarrass you. We have many shy folks here. Okay. How many know that there is a difference between those two laws? There is a difference between those two laws. One is a moral law and one is an actual physical law. It's a law of physics. First thing new we learned today, and we as well throughout this study, and this talk today is in part or largely based on the spiritus literature and based upon this book, Action and Reaction, which we do have here for sale for those of you who wish to go deeper into your study of this particular book. But we cannot discuss the law of action and reaction without mentioning what is going on in the world today. And most specifically, some sad news that has been happening in Brazil, which I'm sure everybody already knows about, but also in, in the US. Things have been happening and many people are asking, or even talking about, well, what is the cause of that? And, and perhaps many spiritists or Buddhists or people who in general who believe in karma might say, well, something they have done in their past life and now they're paying, God's punishing them. So throughout our talk today, we're going to discuss about this punishment. And is there punishment, really? But we're going to discuss about the law of action and reaction, the law of cause and effect. We're going, to talk, we're going to bring some cases that are from the book Action and Reaction themselves. We're going to talk a little bit about, about the historical facts, how this idea of causality has existed, this idea that there was a cause behind things and that there is an effect. But let's also go to the actual book itself. Just for those of you who haven't yet read it, let's just bring some very main characters so we mention them later. You're not entirely lost. So, before I actually even get into the characters, we know the collection of André Luis. And the first book in his series is Nal Solar. If I could just pick it up here real quick. This is the first book in the series of André Luis, Nal Solar. And in this particular book we are discussing today, in Action and Reaction, they're not actually talking about their stories from Nal Solar. They actually travel to a different um, colony that is actually under Nasular's direction. It's like their little brother or little sister. And vibratorily speaking, if we can say that Nasular is here, we would say that Mansal Paz, which is the name of the colony, is like here. It's more closer to the earth. So Andrea Luis and another character called Eladio go to Mansal Paz for a specific purpose, to do an internship, to study the law of cause and effect. So it's kind of like if you're in college and you want to study specifically, I don't know, biochemistry, and you need to know what it's actually like, so you go and study in a lab. You do an internship at John Hopkins. So it's kind of like what they did. They already had spent time in Nasalar studying, so then now they want to learn more about cause and effect. So they go to a place, a colony called Mansal Paz, and that is the actual name of the colony. In the English translation, they did not move it, but in English, a direct translation would be Peace Mansion, for those of you who care to know. But these are the main characters. Drusso, who is actually the mentor slash director and head of Mansal Paz, remember that fact later when we bring the case. It's significant. Mansal Paz, just a little behind the scenes, it's a colony, as we said, under the jurisdiction of Nasalar. It's situated in lower zones. It's an institute of readjustment located in a region punished by a hostile natural environment dedicated to receiving unfortunate or infirm spirits. Patients here can be admitted to more advanced colonies in the higher realms or return to the human sphere, Earth, or some other planet. So in the book, what they describe Mansal Paz is kind of like St. Bernard's Monastery. Maybe some of you might know where that is, but it's somewhere in um, the um, 
the mountains, and it's in a very mountainy, snowy, crazy place. So they kind of describe it just like St. Bernard's Monastery, except that there's no big snowstorm. There's this snow of dense, heavy, toxic energy. And literally, at one point in the book, Andre Louise looks outside from where the colony is, and he becomes startled because he literally sees a sea of faces that are in this hurricane, but it, they're actually uh, souls being whipped around. Andrea Luis is accompanied by his friend, Ilario, who is also a student coming to study the law of cause and effect with him. And of course, we know Andrea Luis, spiritual student from El Solar, visiting Monson Paz to study with Ilario, the law of cause and effect. And also, very important, remember this for later. I'm sorry for those in the back who can't see it. Another important character in this book is Assistant Silas. So basically four main characters, Druso, Silas, who pertain to Manson Paz, and then there's Ilario and Andrea Luis who are just visiting doing an internship. Let us remember that. So when we talk about what we're going to talk about today, we have to understand the world that we live in. And I, I don't just refer to the planet Earth. I refer to just the vast array of life in general. Um, we are immersed in this vibrational field constantly. I'm emitting energy. You all are emitting energy. As a state, we're, I mean, Maryland state, all the people in it, we're emitting energy. As a globe, we're emitting energy. So we're constantly immersed in this vibration. That's why Joanna Dion, just in many of her little message books like Happy Life, like Child of God, she always says we are always influencing one another. We are always suffering the influences of one another because of this vibrational field. So something interesting we wanted to bridge with spiritism is this nursing theorist, her name is Dr. Barbara Dossie. She's married to the very well-known Dr. Larry Dossie, who's, if you know anything about integrative medicine, holistic medicine, he's all over that. So one of the ideas she brings that matches perfectly what Kardec talks about in the Genesis, she says this, an integral understanding recognizes the individual as an energy field connected to the energy fields of others, continuously interacting with changing variables that can lead to greater complexity and order. So we're always immersed. So it's not by chance that we choose this sea, this ocean, just to bring about this idea of immersion. So we're always in the energy fields of one another. So Kardec comes in Genesis, page 363, for those of you on the web who want to go and reference it, look at it. Kardec says this, everything, everything in the universe is connected. Everything forms a chain. Everything is subject to the grand and harmonious law of unity, from the most physically dense to the most spiritually purif purified. So basically, from the subatomic particles to the vast array of solar systems that NASA beautifully you know, posts picture on their website, everything is connected. Remember, remember this, when we talk about the law of cause and effect, everything I do has an effect. We'll talk about it. But everything I do also affects, affects everybody else around me. Because why? We're in this immersion. So what we're doing here is we're kind of building throughout our talk. We're going to build to an accumulation. But as we understand Dr. Barbara Dawsey and we bridge it with spiritism, we also have to bring the historical facts because if Kardec were here, he would do the same. And in actuality, in the introduction of this book of action and reaction, Emmanuel brings a very well-known, or maybe perhaps maybe not so well-known, a historical fact about a very well-known in criminology, a man named Franz Ritter von Litzt. He was a German criminologist, we wonder why did Emmanuel bring this in the introduction of the book Action and Reaction? Well, because he wanted to show us that this idea, because we know in Spiritism says that all the laws of God are written in our conscience. And in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, this famous criminologist, he revolutionized the criminal justice system. Because he says, and Emmanuel quotes his writings when he says, von Litz believed that the tendency to punish is innate due to the necessity of maintaining order. 
So von Litz believed that we needed this idea of this is good, that's bad, in order to control the population, a sort of self-regulatory system. Somewhere in there is that innate moral law telling us, oh, that's not good, yes, that is good. It's that innate law within us. But even further back from von Litz, we go to Hippocrates. Hippocrates, back in 460 BC, he said that every natural event has a natural cause. Makes sense. In this particular quotation, it's a spiritist quotation, we say that nothing is by chance, however, each case is particular. So we know that there is order in the universe, but every case is a case. And there's a beautiful article in the Spiritist magazine that you can go online and, and print out. I actually, pu um, you can get your copy, I believe. You can. You have to pay five, six dollars. But in this edition, I believe it is the twelfth edition of the Spiritist magazine. There's an amazing article by a man by the name of Rodrigo Machado Tavares. And we quote his article because it's all about the law of cause and effect. And we recommend that you go and read it. And we recommend that if you learn nothing from tonight, you remember something he says here. Nothing is by chance, however, each case is particular. Because in that he tells us, look, it's a common thing we do when we look at tragic events and we say, oh, what did they do to deserve that? What kind of criminal were they? So let's just say as a disclaimer, this talk is not a way for us to give, up, to give us, or to give you, to give ourselves a tool to say, here, go and judge your neighbor and go and find out why your neighbor is suffering. That's not why we're here. We're here to understand why we are suffering and how we can have more compassion for our neighbors. The purpose is not to find out why or what that person did to deserve that, but to find ways to help that person through those tragic events. So before we even talk about the law of cause and effect, let's make the distinction now between the law of action and reaction, the law of cause and effect. And let's just say, because we are among spiritists, there's only one law that's God's laws. But for all intents and purposes, because this is a study session, this is a talk, but I like to think of it more as a study session. If you guys have something to say, you can share it. But there really is just God's laws. But for all intents and purposes, because it's a study session, we're going to break it up into moral laws and physical laws. They're all God's laws. I mean, the fact that I can drop this on the floor or here and it falls, law of gravity, it's God's laws. I mean, science thinks it's their laws, but it's really not. Um, but in the Spirits book, part three, it talks about 12 moral laws that are broken up into 10 chapters, one of which we will talk about the law of cause and effect. But here, let's talk about Newton's third law, which is the law of action and reaction. We will attempt to describe it in the, in the most layman's of terms, a complex idea. So basically, it's like this, Newman says. Isaac Newton, not Newman, excuse me, Isaac Newton. He said that the law of action reaction works like this. Imagine that you're standing on a scale, right? So when you're standing on a scale, what's happening? Your weight pushes down on the scale. Makes sense. Well, this causes the scale pointer to point to your weight. Some might be unhappy with that number it points to, but it's okay. So Newton's third law of motion Forces state that forces always act in equal but opposite pairs. This means that when you push on a wall, the wall pushes back, or when you stand on a scale, it pushes up. So this means that when you push on a wall, the wall pushes back on you with a force equal in the strength to the force you exerted. So what's interesting, because Newton also touched on the idea of when we're in space, how come this idea of action and reaction doesn't occur. Well, he gave a very good example. We're going to bring a very good example that we were able to find. Imagine the same woman standing on a scale, except she's in an elevator that's free falling. If she's standing on the scale in an elevator that's free falling, and she directly looks at the pointer 
although I highly doubt she'd be looking at the pointer if she's free falling in an elevator. But if she looks at the pointer as she's free falling in an elevator, it's going to read zero. Why? Because there's nothing to push up against it. So that law kind of zeroes itself out. And that's why, very roughly, that's why when we're in space, we have no gravity. But let's show a great table, the exact differences, the law of cause and effect and the law of action reaction. Let us take note that the law of action reaction, let's remind ourselves that it is, oh, it is a physical law, a law of science, still a law of God. Here, law of cause and effect is a moral law. This is a chart table that was published in the Spiritus magazine, the 12th, which we had brought here today, for those of you who are interested in reading it later. It's a beautiful chart that we've never seen anywhere else, but here you can just read it for yourselves. It depicts it. Here being the physical, a scientific law of action reaction, they say it's, it's binary, whereas a law of cause and effect, which is a moral law, it's non-binary. So binary basically just means, you know, two numbers, zero and one. So unrelated, it doesn't really matter to know what that means, but just that this is a physical law and that this we can prove and hundreds of thousands of scientists have proven that this law exists. We can't necessarily say, or some scientists may say, well, maybe we can't prove the law of cause and effect. Aha, but spiritism, and cut, spiritism comes and says one thing. Well, and Kardec gives this really interesting analogy of, if you look into the sky, and by the way, he gives this analogy in the Genesis. I believe it's chapter 10 or it could be chapter two, I'm sorry. He says, if you look at a bird in the sky and the bird falls down and you pick up the bird and you see that he's been shot by a bullet, well, you have to assume that someone shot that bird. It didn't just spontaneously create a bullet in itself and fall from the sky. So naturally, we have to assume that the cause of that, that effect had a cause, somebody who had a gun that shot it. We have to assume that makes logical sense. So that's how Kardec, in a very simple way, explains how cause and effect exists. So when we look at the complexity of our bodies, of, of our lives, there has to be an intelligent cause. Kardec says, for an intelligent effect, there must be an intelligent cause. So it makes sense if a vast array of birds fall from the sky because they're all shot at. We have to assume that there was someone who caused that to fall. So it's an analogy that he gives that you can read more about in, I believe it's in uh, chapter 10 of the Genesis. But this is something very interesting. So we can, for those of us who weren't aware that there actually was a difference between the two, that this actually is a measurable and valid law. When we talk about the law of cause and effect, we talk about action and reaction. There is also another common term for it, karma, that gets thrown around a lot. So let us understand the way Emmanuel defines karma in this exact book, In Action and Reaction. He says the following. It's an expression among Hindus. It means action in Sanskrit. But, Emmanuel says, it actually implies cause and effect. Every action or movement is the result of previous causes or stimuli. But again, this is something interesting because it, it's a habit that we get into as a society and as a people that we often say, well, what was that cause? But sometimes we spend a little bit too much time on trying to figure out other people's causes. Why did that person go through that? What, what kind of horrible person were they? And we shouldn't get into that mindset. Although it may cross our minds, but we shouldn't get into that habit or mindset of contemplating that, but rather we should offer up our prayers to those that are suffering. Because we hope that when we're enduring something, that we receive compassion from others, that we receive kindness and non-judgment. But sometimes we receive judgment. Something we're all working on, for sure. Because if we're all here, we're, we're here to learn. And that's the beauty of being here today. The beauty of this room is that everybody is vibrating at a level that they are here to learn. So you're vibrating good energy for everybody else in this room. So you're creating this current of I want to learn energy, I want to understand kind of energy, so that's good. We're all here for that purpose. But in spiritism, we come to learn about the law of cause and effect. 
And that Kardec says this, reason tells us that an intelligent effect must have an intelligent force as its cause. It's actually logic. And as much as science is logic, it makes sense. So w another really interesting thing, and perhaps we don't exactly think about this. It doesn't cross our minds. Sometimes we are really focused on our own selves or don't really think outside the box sometimes. But did we know that? The law of cause and effect, there is also an attenuating factor, meaning like this. Let's just say in a past life, I was a thief, right? So in this life, according to law of cause and effect, I have to atone for that. But since God is all loving, he says, look, if you work on yourself, you can have an attenuation of that law. So instead of coming to this life and losing everything, losing all your money from someone come and stealing in your stuff, maybe you only lose a little bit. There's an attenuation of the law. But in as much as us as individuals have to pay back debts, and it's called the individual, there also is something called collective debts. Collective accounts is actually the term that the mentor in the book, Jeruso, talks about. He says that it's kind of like having an account with God. And each one of us, as a person, then as a collective, and as a state, and he calls it like this. There are different types of accounts in the universe. You have the individual, it's like bank accounts, individual and collective accounts, people and races account, institutional accounts, and states account. So when we, looked at, when, we look of, when we look at collective calamities, we oftentimes wonder, well, why did that happen? Well, remember how we talked about we shouldn't focus on why did that happen? Because we're in a study session, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> and as long as you're doing it for purposes of study and to better yourself and not for judgment, because this is what all these books are all about. They talk about the behind the scenes of the laws of cause and effect, why people endure what they endure because of what they've done in the past, but not in a judgmental way, but in a way to educate one another. And that's why we're here discussing this. But it's something interesting because when we talk about collective, uh, collective calamities that happen, it could, in theory, according to the books that we read, it could possibly be because that particular group of people committed crimes together or just they transgressed the law of God, if we can put it in a less judgmental way. But the mentor, Sanzio, page 83, puts it in this way. For us, it means the account we, must, we all must pay, including our debts and credits. There are accounts of this kind, not only listing and defining individual persons, but all peoples and races, states and institutions. So we are constantly, it's interesting because we are constantly in this, we are constantly in this immersion, but we also it's like we're carrying around our own personal hard drive all the time. Last week, Leo mentioned about the brick, and I really tried hard to bring something like the brick, and all we could think about was <laughs> carrying around this individual hard drive with us all the time. It's constantly in the inner recesses of us. And so wh whatever is good, whatever is bad, we have to fix. But God doesn't punish us saying, oh, bad you, you have to atone for that. But he says, come on, you can do better. That's, that's the interesting thing about the law of cause and effect because we take it as something is, well, God is punishing me. That's why I am enduring this hardship with my father. He's just a horrible person and God's just punishing me. Not quite. It's all about education. When we lack or when we have in the past not followed according to these divine laws that were set into place for our own happiness, in part three of the Spirit's book, it says these laws are the laws for us to find our happiness. It's not a castrating God, respectfully, we say that. It's not a castrating God. It's a God that wants to educate us for our own happiness because he knows that once we get, come out of that pit of misery, we find more joy. But something else we also wanted to discuss in terms of historical events. So we don't believe that it's just back in the 1800s or just in 460 BC. This idea of law of cause and effect existed with the Hebrews, believed in causality, and they didn't believe in just chance. 
Christians also, like the Hebrews, believe that there was order and causality. And you can look throughout the books of Mark and Luke. There are many verses that talk about the God being the first cause of all things. And there are a lot of theologians use those books to show that it's what Christian believed. And we still believe today. Many Babylonians believe that the gods can do anything at any time and a change, which is a change in the Hebrew idea of causality. So there's many different ideas that were similar to the law of cause and effect. So this idea was throughout humanity because it's within us, it's innate. That for everything, for every effect, there is, there is a cause. Galileo, interestingly enough, he lived between 1564 and 1642. He was a professor of mathematics at the University of Padua. He used mathematics to state scientific processes with vigor and relationship to, that clearly showed cause and effect relationships. So we see it existed throughout humanity. The idea, the notion of some form of law of cause and effect, it existed, whether religious and non-religious people, because it's innate within us. But one of the beauties that spiritism brings to us is that how does the law of cause and effect take effect? If we're just hanging out in the spiritual realm, we can't really pay off any debts that we have. We do have to reincarnate unless you reach the state of Christ, then it's a different story. But the law of reincarnation, the point of it is this word, purification. Sometimes this word has a really bad connotation to it. We think of purification as something that's unattainable. It's impossible. But we hope to strip it of that connotation and saying we're just trying to aim for our inner happiness and for the happiness of others. Because purification, simply put, is just the complete opposite of selfishness. When we seek to think of only ourselves first. So through reincarnation, we go through these process. But it also is to redress or to fix previous mistakes. You know, those ones that we love that perhaps we didn't do so well with, we get to come back and fix it. Or perhaps we get to come back and help them fix their issues because we care about them. And we see many cases throughout the spiritist literature, throughout the Andrea Louise collection of such cases. But also to affect human progress. How many of you know about a famous scientist, Michael Faraday? Oh, homework. Michael Faraday, he is known to be one of the most monumental scientists of his time. And they refer to him as his story, his life story as being something very romantic. And I'll tell you why. Because he never went to college. He was self-taught. But he surpassed all of his mentors and all the scientists of his era, yet he never went to college. He only had a high school degree, and, but he became fascinated with science in, at a young age, and he wound up getting a, a job where he was exposed to more science, and he actually was quoted saying he studied the entire Encyclopedia Britannica. He grew up in London a couple centuries ago, and he came up with, and he actually discovered the many different scientific findings, one of which he's probably most famous, known for, the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And many people know about Maxwell and many other thinkers that came after him that proved all of his theories. But we see that it's minds like that who come to the planet Earth to do what? To affect human progress. What he discovered, which may not seem like I'm not really into science, Kirsten, uh, what I really care. Well, the American, the industry revolution, or revolutionary of the industry, was in part because of him, his findings. So the things that we enjoy, we take for granted, were because of minds like him that we don't ever, rarely ever mention. Maybe in some distant scientific conventions with a lot of old men who wear glasses and nobody really talks to them, you might hear his name. But he is a man who not many know, but has affected human progress as we know it today. There are many minds like that. And this is the purpose of reincarnation. And we could see that his life, only reincarnation can explain. Because there's no way that a young man 
had such a belief in these absurd ideas that other scientists did not, did not believe in. And there's a famous quote when he went to meet a scientist who he was friends with. His name was Sir Humphrey Davy. And it's a famous quote, because when he goes to finally meet with him to try and convince him to admit him to his society for science, Sir Humphrey Davy turns to him and says that science is a harsh mistress. <laughs> and he goes on to say, but it's a famous quote that uh, actually many scientists quote and don't even know where the quote comes from. But it's, it's famous because not too long after that did he, be, he became catapulted in science. And the rest you can read online. But it's very interesting because there really are great minds that reincarnate and help push us forward. But when we talk about earlier about the law of cause and effect, we have to take into account God's love, right? I mean, if God's love wasn't as great as it was, then all of us would be paying back exactly what we did to other people. And that'd be really harsh. We could probably say that, you know, in that context, God is not a loving God. But of course, since he is, we have something called attenuation of the law. So let's just say you do something, X, whatever it is. It can have different outcomes. You can have an outcome of X, Y, or Z, according to our human language, right? Us being the judge. But according to divine law, law of love and justice and compassion, what will, what will the reaction be? What will happen? Well, we don't know for sure, great certainty, because one of the beginning quotes we share, that yes, nothing is by chance, but every case is a different case. We are literally looked at as separate cases every single time. Something for us to think about and know that this idea, this notion of laws, has existed throughout humanity. The Code of Hammurabi in the 1800 BC, of course the Ten Commandments, infamously known, and then Jesus bringing the law of justice, love, and compassion. These laws have always existed, and these are the laws we were referring to in part three of the Spirit's book, The Divine Laws. It's broken up in 10 chapters, but actually it's 12 separate laws that we highly recommend that you and we all read it because the spirits tell us that it's within these laws we will find our happiness. So it's okay. We don't need to go out and buy the most latest CD or self-help book, which you can still. It always is a compliment. But if we simply begin to read and actually study a lot about that, we begin to find a moral compass with our lives. But let's get into some of the best part of tonight's evening, which is the actual cases from the book Action and Reaction. So remember I told you earlier to remember who this guy is? Drusso? <sighs> Professor Adekaibe, you went and told the answer. So we all remember he is the director of Mansal Paz. Who is Silas? Assistant. Hilario? Student. And Andre Louise, we all know who he is. So this is in chapter 18. This is a story about collective expiations. It has to do with a plane crash that occurred and killed, let's say, roughly 20 people. And right when the plane crash occurred, there was this urgent plea from Earth to help the victims of the plane crash. So it's interesting, they go, Andre Luis, actually before they go, before Druso goes with his team, they actually watch the whole event on like this screen in Druso's office and literally it had just happened and they're watching the, the spirits that just recently discarnated. Some are very confused, some are anguished, some are not so anguished. So we see there's different levels that are occurring. So as, there, as Eladio and Andrea Louise are watching this whole scene on this screen, they ask the mentor several questions, and one of which they turn to him and say, have you ever seen these things happen before, and why do they happen? You know, what's up with the collective um, mass, you know, deaths? Why do they occur, for lack of a better way to put it? So Druso says, yes, I actually do know of a specific case of dear friends of Manson Paz. It's the case of Escanio and Lucas. They actually were in an area, they had evolved up to a, remember, Mansal Paz was lower than Al Salar. They had actually evolved up to go to a different colony. And they were constantly working and doing works of love and charity. 
but they wanted to go even higher. They wanted to ascend to a higher colony. But they kept, you know, when they were going to their superiors, because, you know, of course there's order in the spiritual realm. You have to submit your application. You have to wait for guys to come back. It's like the government. It's a whole process of a bunch of guys reviewing your stuff. That's how it's portrayed. It's very orderly, except it's not like how it is in the physical plane. They literally can read your energetic field. Like they can come over to Venezia and just see everything. Like the hard drive, it's like right here. Just, you know, see everything. So they kept getting denied access. So they literally went through all these processes. It was like they finally submitted something to like the Supreme Court, what we would call, to say, hey, they really wanted to know what's going on. So, and Drus was telling this story, and he says, well, they found out once they went to the spiritual court, so to speak, but it's much more loving. It's not like, you know, how it is here. So they go, and they, pre they are presented amongst a, a board of higher spirits because they want to know, why can't we get admitted? They say, okay, we're going to do regression therapy right here and now, and we're going to show you, let's say, on this screen, of why you can't get admitted. So as they're doing that, they, they regress back and they go through their long list of these, these two guys. They're saying, okay, yep, last 500 years, you guys are doing pretty awesome. Uh, but going to, oh, here it is, 14th century, when Joan of Arc was doing her thing. It turns out these two f guys, they're friends back then, the 14th century. And what had happened was, was that they wanted to climb up the ranks of her army. So they decided they were both going to push these two guys over a cliff to their death in order to, you know, climb up the scale of soldierhood. So, and as they continue to unveil all these memories, the high director turns them and says, would you like us to continue? Because it's very dramatic having to remember all of those horrific crimes we do. And they both say, nope, we're good. Let's just let's start working on plan to come back. And it's exactly what they did. These two guys earned enough merit to return back to the earth, choose exactly where they're going to reincarnate, choose the exact plan. And this is rare because you really have to be an elevated spirit to get to choose everything. They got to choose their body, everything. So we see that that was holding them back, not because the spirits were saying, oh, you're bad, you can't come up, but vibratorily speaking, unconsciously speaking, their energy was still a little bit low in some areas, and they couldn't get why, because the unconscious mind can really push things below the surface that they themselves, as elevated spirits as they were, they didn't remember. They could not recall what had happened to them. So... In this, Druso ends his long dissertation. He says that collective suffering is the medicine that corrects our mutual wrongs. Because he says, what did indeed happen? Ascanio, Ascanio, and Lucas, what did they choose? Well, since they had murdered two people, the both of them, together, they said, okay, we choose to come back in the area of aviation. We're going to help push progress forward. And we also want to choose to die in an airplane with others who have the similar deaths as we do. And they did. They died, both of them, not on this particular airplane, but on another airplane with a bunch of other people who were collectively paying off a debt. And Druso brings this to us. The collective suffering is the medicine that corrects our mutual wrongs. And again, not that God is punishing us. But for as Kenyo and Lucas, they just wanted to pay it off. It's kind of like a credit card. You know what? I don't want to pay off monthly. Let me just give a lump sum. That was their choice because they had that choice. For others, as we talked before, there can be attenuation, but that was their choice. Let us talk about something else called a mitigated debts. It's another case of how the law of cause and effect can work. This is the case of Adelio Cohea. Let us just give this a little disclaimer. This has no relation to the Cohea family that currently attend the Spiritual Society of Baltimore. <laughs> just so nobody gets any ideas in their brain. This is the case of Adelino Correa. He is a speaker at a Spiritist Center, and he is well-renowned in his particular center because he's highly regarded. He's a very humble guy. He's a simple man, extremely dedicated Spiritist practitioner but he has a serious physical illness. 
he has this chronic eczema. Not the kind you just get on your elbows, but it literally covers his entire body. And he also has a nine-year-old daughter, and he has two adopted sons, Mario and Raul. And he also recently comes into, someone drops off a baby on his doorstep, and he also adopts him, so he has a total of four children. So Andrea Louise feels so sad when they go to visit this particular spiritist center, and they decide that they're going to study this case of Adelino Correa, because the mentors think it's good. So they come to find out, this guy is fantastic. He's well-loved, he's very humble, he's kind. He has so many virtues that Andrea Louise is saying, why, does he, why is he suffering? So when they dig a little deeper, they actually come to find out that Adelino's wife abandoned him, and now he is left with now all these children he cares for by himself. And it's such a scene when Andrea Louise and they're studying the case, and we feel so much pity for this man. And in the midst of when they're studying the case, Andre Louise is there in the center, in the, in the spiritual realm, but observing. It's like he were, he were to come here and observe all of us. We don't see him. But he's there taking his notes. And as he's taking his notes, he's noticing that there are spirits that are coming up to um, the mentor and saying, look, uh, excuse me, I'm here on behalf of uh, Mr. Adelino. He's a really good guy. Could you really help him out? And there's like two, three spirits coming and going, asking for his assistance. And Adrian Louis, Louise is even more taken aback as to what really happened to this guy. And because of time and purposes, we're going to kind of go through his story briefly. So in a past life, many lives ago, Adelino in the time in Brazil where slavery was not outlawed yet, there was a rich man by the name of Martin Gaspar, and he was Adelino's father. But how he became his father is a sad story because Martin Gaspar actually was a landowner who used to abuse the women. He used to rape them, and when they had his children, he used to sell them and their children so they would leave so he wouldn't have to deal with it. But for some reason, which they didn't get into in the book, when he came to know of this particular son, Martin Jr., he immediately fell in love with him. The mother actually died during childbirth, so he actually took the son in, his only son that he acknowledged. And later on, once his son became around the age of 21, they moved together and his father married a young 23-year-old, Maria Amelia. Of course, what happened, she's beautiful, she's charming. Her son fell in love with his stepmother. They began an illicit affair, unbeknownst to the father. He becomes very jealous. So the father decides, you know what? I'm going to kill my father because I want Maria Amelia all to myself. So what does he do? He gets two farmhands, Antonio and Lucidio, to kill his father. Goodbye, Martin Gaspar. But the way he killed him is significant. Antonio and Lucidio give Martin Gaspar, Martin's father, Martin Jr.'s father, a sedative, a very heavy sedative. So once he falls asleep, he lights his father on fire, and he dies that way, semi-alive. He burns to death and then dies that way. So actually, so what happens, of course, naturally, father passes away, wakes up in the spirit realm, gets extremely upset, naturally, follows Martin for years and obsesses him until such point till he dies. Long story short, who are all these people today? Well, guess what? Martin Jr. is Adelino Cojea. Why does Adelino Cojea have problems with eczema? Because this, the, the mentor tells us that his guilt was so profound for killing his father that the, the memory of watching his father burn alive, it was impregnated in his mind, so he produced this e eczema all over his body. Now let's give a little um, <coughs> side note here. Please do not think that every case of eczema is like this. As we very emphatically mentioned in the beginning, every case is a case, not every case of eczema, is because you burn somebody in the past life. I get eczema, I don't think I burned anybody. So, <laughs> I hope not. Um, so let's not, let's not judge. Let's just try to understand. Who are, in modern day times, Antonio and Lucidio? 
Mario and Raul, the two adopted children that he adopted, whom he loves tremendously. And as you can see here, his daughter, Marissa, was his ex-lover, who is now his daughter, Marissa, the nine-year-old. Who is Martin Gaspar? There's only one person left. The newborn. It's a very dramatic scene that they paint. Later, we will discuss a prayer before Adelino. And this is his entire life was in preparation to receive his father back into his maternal, his paternal heart. And it's so beautiful because the most significant thing is, remember we talked about Drusso, and I asked you to remember the significance. He's a director of Monson Paz, who they say never takes vacations. Spirits also take somewhat breaks. Doesn't take breaks, doesn't take spirit vacations, doesn't, he works, 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 as all most high spirits do. Never takes a break, ever. But for this case, he comes from Mansal Paz, Drusso, to meet with Adelino because of his merit that he has, that he has created in his life, to say a prayer about 20 minutes before the mother of this newborn son abandons him on the doors of Adelino, who is his father. He does a very moving prayer, which we will serve as our meditation later. But before we get there, as we come to sort of a closing to our study today, Mentor Drusso, and we really recommend you to go and read this book because it's extremely moving. Throughout the book, he gives tips how to live a better life. We know that the laws of God are, in, are constantly with, are in action. They're within us. Whatever we do, we, we know whether we've done something wrong or not, wrong or not, because our own conscience calls our attention. So he gives us tips to live a happier life so we don't make mistakes and then later feel regretful. He tells us, first, learn to bear the incomprehension and hostility of others with humility and love. And this is something that Adelino was able to most definitely accomplish and one of the reasons why he had so much merit. The wife who left him, he had compassion for. The father who abandoned him at a young age, he had compassion for because he accepted his particular reincarnatory plan. One of the most underutilized things, cultivating prayer, serving our neighbors. Dr. Stephen Post published a book saying it's good to be good based on research, that it literally is physically and emotionally good for us to be charitable. It really is. You should look at the book. We recommend it. Druso also says, let us be willing to forgive those who have offended us with the sincere purpose of asking for forgiveness from our own victims. Work for goodness. Do charitable acts. Pursue worthwhile learning, faith, and goodwill, optimism, and work. These may seem like things that are really simple, like Perhaps we think we need to make drastic changes, and sometimes that's the issue we have. We think that we need to make huge changes in our lives. Since we can't affect a huge change, we just give up altogether. The spirits tell us that the progress we make in every life is so small, sometimes it's unmeasurable. So we shouldn't lose hope or get discouraged. The spirits tell us in the spirits book. Something for us to reflect about and think about. And we may think, well, I, mean, I want to do something larger. Work on the small things first, perhaps in your family, perhaps in your everyday relationships. Try to be more understanding towards others who have done wrong to you. And let us say, and Joanna Dion just tells us in the book Happy Life, she says, look, it's not easy to suffer, to endure hardships. Life can be very harsh, and the trials we endure, it's not a joke. We don't say these words in passing like it's no big deal, that people really don't suffer great calamities and hardships and heartbreaks. There's a lot of heartbreak that occurs right around us we don't and maybe we'll never know about. But it is real and that's why utilizing prayer and taking every opportunity to be kind to someone, especially those rude people in our lives who we think they're just mean, more than likely they are suffering and they don't know how to get out of their suffering because they, nobody ever taught them. They had poor parents that cared very little about their upbringing. 
Maybe they didn't have one loving person in their life. Maybe God placed you in their pathway for that one moment to smile at them. And that could be the spark that gets them going. Seek out art and constructive meditation. And this is from Druso, alternative therapies to help us. Yoga, art, meditation, to help us to live a better life. These aren't the end all to be all, but these are steps towards a better life for all of us. So remember when I said that one of the most moving parts, many moving parts in this book, was right before Adelino it brings and accepts his father as his newborn son, who actually is just basically abandoned on his doorstep. It's a very moving scene, and I wish we had a theatrical team that could play it out, because when we read it, we sobbed for the first time. We read it the second time, maybe not, we didn't cry as hard, but it's very moving. So the prayer that Drusso says, and you have to understand, Andrea Louise says, Drusso is such a busy guy, and I'm saying in layman's terms what he says. He's so busy. He literally, when he came, he went straight to the point. He got there. He went to Adelino. Adelino came out of his body, and he immediately said, Adelino, let us pray. And allow me to pray, play this as part of our meditation. Because when we read this prayer, we realized something. This prayer can be said by all of us. Because the words that he says, they can pertain to all of our lives. The great suffering we endure, if we have to face difficulties and we need strength. Because why did Druso come? Because Adelino, even though he had paid off a lot of his debts in that life and had suffered tremendously, the one last thing he had to tie up in that life was to accept back the father whom he had killed and love him unconditionally. And, Drew, and Adelino sobbed, but was cried, was able to regain courage with this prayer. So let us also, if we can, close our eyes, listen to it, be inspired by it. And from here, we will pass to our passes moment. God of goodness, Father of infinite love, you have created time as the tireless guardian of our souls destined for your bosom. Strengthen us for the necessary renewal. You know our crimes and desertions. Grant us the blessing of pain and time to redeem them, and anoint us with the understanding of your laws, so that we do not waste any opportunity to pay our debts. You have lent us the treasures of work and suffering as favors of your mercy, so that we may dedicate ourselves to our dolores, but just regeneration. We are prisoners of guilt, but we are looking for our freedom, helped by the breath of your love. O oh, Father, infuse us with courage so that our weaknesses may be forgotten. Inflame our spirits with sacred enthusiasm for the good, so that evil does not destroy our good intentions, and lead us along the pathway of self-denial, so that our minds do not stray from you. May we pray like Jesus, the Divine Master, whom you sent to our hearts in order for us to accept your designs entirely. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom 
the power and the glory forever. So be it. Let us be encouraged by those words from the mentor, Druso. And if we are before great challenges in our lives, or if we have crossed great challenges, for sure we know that for every great river that we cross with difficulty and we succeed, sometimes there's another one up ahead. So let us take courage and let us also prepare ourselves for another therapeutic moment of tonight, which is the moment of passes in these moments where our, our mentors, our spirit guides, whatever term we want to give it, they are here with us now, willing to assist us, remind us to be courageous, remind us of our mission, of our own reincarnatory plan, our purpose in life. No matter what we believe in, what our religion is, we still have this great creator that is always watching out for us that always wants our happiness as well as the happiness of others. Let us remember this. Enduring the passes as we are awaiting our turn. If you wish, you can visualize the picture on the screen. It's a beautiful picture of flowing water. Or perhaps you might prefer a beach. Whatever is more dear and calming to your particular heart Imagine that in being with your dear guardian angel or being with a dear and loving friend whom you feel calm and loved by to allow you to elevate your thoughts, to tune in to the good and noble spirit doctors and nurses that are here tonight. As we call up our practitioners to serve May we continue to vibrate peace, love, harmony as we continue out throughout our passes session.